Welcome back to the Deep Dive. We're here, as always, to sift through the noise, pull out the key bits of info, and uh, really give you the essentials on complex topics. And today, we are diving headfirst into, well, unified AI infrastructure. Specifically, we're looking at a platform that's been making some waves. The Bytes Unified Serverless AI Model API. Right. Our mission today is pretty straightforward. We want to cut through the marketing hype, you know, hmm. understand the tech, the realities, and crucially, the trade-offs involved with the Bytes. They're basically pitching themselves as this radical simplification, a single way to access, what, potentially hundreds of thousands of machine learning models. Yeah, it sounds amazing on the surface. But what's really going on under the hood? What do we need to look out for? Well, the core value proposition, the thing that just jumps out from their docs, is all about operational simplicity. Mm -hmm. They literally call themselves an AI model as a service platform. They're selling this idea that uh, developers shouldn't have to worry about managing VMs or updating containers or building scaling logic. None of that. So they just take that whole operational headache away. Is that the pitch? Exactly. They handle the runtime, the scaling, the infrastructure, all of it. Their motto kind of sums it up perfectly. No infra, no orchestration, just plug, play, and build. Awesome. And look, for anyone who spent, you know, weeks wrestling with some tricky GPU configuration, mm. that simplicity sounds really appealing. Oh, absolutely compelling, no doubt. But let's talk about the scale for a second, because the numbers here are well, they're huge. Our sources say Bytes claims support for over 150,000 serverless AI models. All through this one API, that's that's not just a library, that's an entire ecosystem. It's a breathtaking scope, really. And it covers the whole spectrum of machine learning, it seems. It's not just your typical LLMs, your text <laughs> generation models. We're talking text generation, yeah, but also image classification, object detection, segmentation, even audio tasks. Pretty much the works. I also saw terms like embeddings and feature extraction listed in the sources. For listeners maybe newer to some ML concepts, what do those actually mean? Why would a developer need them? That's a great question, actually, because they're sort of foundational building blocks in a lot of modern AI. Think of embeddings as um, turning complex stuff, like a sentence or even an image, into a compact list of numbers, a vector. Okay, numbers. Why? Because computers are great with number. They can quickly compare these vectors, see how similar things are. It's like how search engines figure out New York and NYC are basically the same thing. Got it. And feature extraction. Kind of related. It's about pulling out the most important bits, the key characteristics from raw data. Mm -hmm. You might do this to feed into a smaller, more specialized model for something like classification. And Vitez apparently offers models for both right within that massive 150K count. And it's not just the models either, is it? Our sources mentioned they're trying to build this wider knowledge ecosystem, something about accessing over 440K plus interactive papers. Yeah, like a research library bolted onto the deployment platform. It's an interesting angle. But that whole approach really highlights the main benefit, that unified structure. You only need one SDK client, Python or JavaScript apparently, and that one SDK handles everything off, picking the model, starting it up, running it, getting the results back, even streaming. Right. If you were doing this yourself, you'd be juggling, what, dozens of different API keys, different code for each provider? Exactly. Total headache. Here, it's supposed to be one system for everything. That consistency sounds powerful. But okay, let's say I'm switching models a lot, maybe from text summarization to some specialized image thing. How consistent is it really? What does the code actually look like for a developer? Well, the beauty, according to them, is that the workflow is extremely repetitive doesn't matter what the task is. First, you need an API key, authentication, which mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, you get through their Discord or email signup, not the usual dashboard route, maybe. Oh, huh. different. Okay. Yeah. Once you're authenticated, you just pick the model using its identifier. Usually looks like what you'd find on, say, Hugging Face, like OpenAI Community GP2 for text, or maybe Enomic, embe Enomic Embed Text V1.5 for those embeddings we talked about. And the interaction uses just a few simple commands, right? That's what I gathered. Absolutely. Looks like four main ones control the whole serverless lifecycle. You use model.load to spin up the instance. Okay, load. Then model.run to actually do the work, the inference. Makes sense. And if you want to check if it's ready or, importantly, shut it down to stop the billing, you've got model.status and model.stop. Right, so if I'm using that nomic embed text model you mentioned to turn text into a vector, the input's my text string, the output's my list of numbers. Exactly, and that's the key, right? Whether the model expects text or a URL to an image or maybe a big chunk of image data, the developer just calls 
model.run, the complexity of handling those different inputs supposedly hidden away. We've covered text vectors. What about images? Say I need, I don't know, image segmentation, finding outlines of objects in a picture. Does the same API structure work there? It seems so. For segmentation, you might pick a model like Facebook Sam Vit Base. The calls are still model.load, model.run, but now your input is an image, maybe a URL or encoded beta, and the output is some structured format describing the masks or outlines. The interface itself doesn't change. That's why it could be really useful for apps doing multiple types of AI tasks. And importantly, they haven't totally locked people into their own tools. Mm -hmm. the sources mentioned their Python and JS SDKs, yes, but also integration with other libraries like LightLM. Yeah, and that's a big deal. LightLM is basically this um, wrapper. It lets developers talk to lots of different AI APIs using one consistent method. By supporting LightLM, Bytes is kind of signaling, hey, we play nice with others. Makes it easier to slot them into existing projects. They even mentioned Docker images for running models locally, so lots of flexibility there. Okay, this all sounds like maximum convenience, almost zero operational burden, which you know inevitably brings us to the big trade-off. The reality check of serverless. Let's shift gears. Cost and latency. This is critical. Right. This is where the rubber really meets the road. If the promise is all this amazing serverless convenience, what's it actually going to cost the user and how fast is it? So the financial model seems super granular. Billing starts from the first 60 seconds the model's active and then it's rounded up to the nearest minute after that. And the rate they give in the docs is incredibly specific. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 6, 6, 6 seconds per GB second on GPUs. Okay, hold on. That micro-level pricing needs some unpacking. What exactly is a GB second? What does that measure? It's designed to measure resource consumption very precisely. It's not just about how long the instance runs, but critically, how much GPU memory and compute power it's using during that time. Mm -hmm. So a small, efficient model running for a minute costs less in GB seconds than a huge memory-hungry model running for that same minute. Ah, okay, so it forces you to think about the model's efficiency itself, not just runtime. Exactly. You need to be aware of how resource-intensive your chosen model is. But that serverless structure, it immediately brings up the big penalty we have to talk about, gold but latency. Because these models aren't just sitting there warm and ready, right? When you call model.load, the system has to find a server, pull down potentially gigabytes of model data, allocate the GPU, initialize everything. That takes time. Yeah, and when we usually talk about serverless cold starts, we might grumble about, what, 10 seconds, yep. 20, maybe a minute for a really heavy function. Mm. Is Bytes in that range? Uh, No, not even close. Brace yourself for this number. The cold boot times are, well, they're significant. We are talking around 12 minutes for their smallest model examples and potentially up to 15 minutes for the largest ones. 15 minutes. Wait, seriously? 15 minutes, yeah. That's I mean, I could make coffee, answer emails, walk the dog, mm. and my model still might not be ready. That yeah. completely changes how you'd build something. Absolutely. It fundamentally shifts the use case. And you have to weigh that against how long the instinct stays warm once it is loaded. The default timeout seems to be 30 minutes in some examples, though others show a configurable 300 seconds, so five minute option. So best case, it takes 15 minutes to load, stays warm for 30. Yeah. You've got this narrow window before you hit that massive delay again. Wow. Yeah. So this really brings up the core question for you listening in. Does that amazing simplicity, that access to 150,000 models, actually justify waiting potentially 12 to 15 minutes for it to start up? That delay dictates everything. Well, okay, let's try and synthesize this. Strength, limitations, what are the clear upsides for a developer who wants to move fast? Okay, strength, hashtag one. The unified interface, that yeah. consistency across different tasks, text, image, whatever, using the same commands, that's a big development win. Definitely. Second, the wide ecosystem. Just having that choice, 100K plus models without needing different setups for each, huge flexibility. Third, managed infrastructure. Just yeah. forgetting about VMs, containers, scaling rules, that frees up a ton of operational resources. And fourth, I'd say rapid prototyping. Yeah. If you're just exploring, trying to see which model works best for a new idea, this platform could be a really slick, frictionless way to test things quickly, like a sandbox. Totally agree. But then... The limitations are just as stark, number one, obviously. Cold boot latency, that 12 to 15 minute wait, it just kills it for anything needing a fast response. Like, forget real-time user interactions. Yeah, absolutely off the table. Then there's the challenge with cost transparency and variability. They give you that GB second rate, okay, but your actual bill. That depends entirely on which specific model you pick, how resource hungry it is. You'd need to monitor usage really carefully, I imagine. A heavy model could run up costs quickly without you realizing. 
Right. And related to that, with 150,000 different models running on what's presumably shared serverless hardware, you have to expect huge performance variability, latency, throughput. It's probably all over the map depending on the model and maybe even system load. Good point. And finally, you give up control. You don't get fine-grained knobs for custom scale, and you can't guarantee dedicated hardware, no easy way to do custom model fine-tuning within their environment. You get what they give you. So, putting it all together, where does Bytez actually make sense? Where is it a good fit? Well, definitely for that rapid experimentation and prototyping phase we mentioned, when speed of trying things out is key. Yeah, and maybe for multitask applications, if your backend genuinely needs to juggle text, image, and audio tasks, Having that single consistent API could be a little lifesaver for integration. True, and probably for small to medium scale projects where the team really values developer velocity and wants to leverage lots of open source models without the infra hassle. Right, where the cold start time might be acceptable or they can architect around it somehow. Conversely, you should definitely use caution or probably look elsewhere. Well, number one, if you need ultra low latency, guaranteed fast startup, like under 100 milliseconds, this isn't it. Nope. Second, probably not great for very large-scale, super cost-sensitive deployments where you need predictable pricing, maybe through reserved instances or something. That variable GB second model could get tricky at massive scale. And third. High compliance situations. If you need dedicated hardware, strict data isolation for regulatory reasons, the shared serverless nature here might just not cut it. So this deep dive really highlights the central tension with the Bytes API, doesn't it? It's this mm -hmm. trade-off. You get incredible flexibility, this unparalleled choice of models. Like access to almost everything out there. But the price you pay for that convenience is this potentially massive serverless cold boot delay. Yeah, it's a platform that definitely democratizes access to a huge range of models, makes sophisticated AI much more approachable. It feels built for people who value breadth, choice, and iteration speed above all else. Above guaranteed low latency performance anyway, you just have to design your system to either hide that 12, 15 minute wait from the user or have use cases where it simply doesn't matter. Which brings us nicely to our final provocative thought for you to chew on as you think about platforms like this. If your business does rely on that kind of quick, iterative testing across lots of different open source models, you know, the kind you find on Hugging Face and elsewhere. How do you really calculate the total cost of ownership, TCO? Right, because TCO isn't just that listed GB second price. It's got to include the direct usage costs, yes, but also those hidden operational costs. Specifically, the cost implications of needing to keep instances warm just to avoid that killer 12 to 15 minute cold start penalty for the next user or the next job. Exactly. Paying for idle time is often the unspoken cost of demanding speed in a system designed for cost saving via scaling to zero. How much of that super low GB second rate do you effectively cancel out by paying to keep an instance idling for, say, 30 minutes just so the next interaction is fast? That's the calculation you need to make. Something to think about. Indeed. Well, that's our deep dive for today. Until next time. See you in the next deep dive.